Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on today um, at, here at UQ and thank them for the custodianship of the, of the land over a very long period of time. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders and ancestors and elders past and present. I'd also like to extend that respect to um, the land where I grew up, Bundjalung country, and, and thank them for the custodianship of that land. It's a very beautiful place and I'm very grateful for that. I'd also like to welcome and thank um, the Indigenous staff or students that are in the room or online today and thank them for their contributions to the UQ community. And then we'll move on. Thank you, John. So this is what we'll be doing today. Uh, Chris will be introducing concept of learning design or universal design <laughs> to you, sorry. I uh, might get a maybe a show of hands in the room and a thumbs up online if you've come across the universal design principles before. Yeah, so, okay, great. So we've got a, a bit of a mix. So we'll, we'll um, introduce those and then we'll have a fantastic student panel to talk a little bit about assessment design and inclusivity, which is fantastic. So that's Claire and Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, there'll be a short reflection if we have time. Uh, and then we'll be getting into some examples from economics and from humanities. So thank you, John and Linda, for coming to speak today. Then we'll be having some hands-on opportunities to look at some mock assessment items and have a go at making some changes before we finish up for today. Next slide. Thank you, John. Um, that's what we hope we'll get to by the end of this hour and a half. It's not a long period of time, but we hope you'll have a bit more confidence about applying some universal design or inclusive principles to assessment. We hope you'll feel more confident to make some changes that you'd like in your assessment tasks or courses. Next slide, please, John. Yeah, just some um, rules of the day, particularly if you're online, you can leave your camera on or off. That's totally fine. Obviously, please mute your mic until there's an opportunity to speak. If you're in the room, please feel free to raise your hand if you have a question and that's the same online. Um, if you're online, you can use the chat for discussion. We'll be also using a couple of tools today, just a few. <laughs> um, if you're online, feel free to use the chat and the Zoom reactions. And all of us will be using Padlet to access a range of other tools. <laughs> um, so if you could maybe go to the next slide, John, we're just gonna do a check now to see if we can all access the Padlet. So there's a short bit.ly link you can try. You could scan the QR code. And uh, we may put a link directly in the chat for those online as well. There's also QR codes floating around the room. So at some point, if you lose the link to the Padlet, it will be up somewhere on a wall to have another go. Thank you, Adi. Oh, sorry, I also forgot to mention that Adi will be supporting us online. And we also have Shari in the room for uh, oodles of learning design support. <laughs> uh, and then I think we'll hand over now to Chris to get on with uh, the main part of today. Thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, I he heard that many of you, I could see that many of you have are familiar with UDL, but I just thought we'd just do a quick primer just to give a sense of what we're talking about today. So um, what, um, one, of the, one of the nice things we can do with UDL is not only do things with text, but, but use metaphor and other, other ways of representation. So here's a metaphor for the difference between uh, no adjustment, no adjustment at all, which is just some stairs. Um, the middle middle image is an adjustment, which stairs and ramps. And you can imagine um, if you're um, if you're having a conversation, if you're in a wheelchair or you're using a pram, and you're having a conversation with a colleague, you have to split up, and then you have to come back together. So there's a bit of a sense of othering there, which we we try to avoid, and and. Here's an example of universal design on the right. And it's not necessarily um, intentional, but, um, but you can imagine that regardless of whether you've got a pram or, or, or um, you have to travel by wheel, or um, even if you're delivering food or moving a rubbish, rubbish bin, um, it's, it's accessible to all. Next slide, please, John. And yet another metaphor. So, Here's a, here's a slide that John presented, and I think it's a really nice one. Um, if we if we had this mindset that all our students are the same and they're this homogenous being, um, then we make some pretty wild assumptions that 
they're all the same type of person. And there's a certain, uh, one of these students will do better than the others because not because of, um, uh, because of who they are basically. Okay, so we have the pleasure of having our two students, two students to come and talk to us today about UDL and how it's affected them. So thank you, Claire and Elizabeth. Um, and and um, especially thank you for coming at the pointy end of the semester. Thank you so much. Um, so Claire, I might start with you. Um, can you tell us about a time when an assessment task created additional learning barriers? Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, I study literature and writing and I have dyslexia, so I kind of set myself up for a few learning barriers, um, which I have sort of grown used to, but a lot of the time, like longer form essays, like 2000 words plus, are just very hard for me to manage because I'm dealing with multiple texts, research, and like having to write and comprehend myself. Um, yeah. um, yes, I'm a student with a disability as well. I am studying at the School of Public Health. So I'd say any time an assignment that's really presented a challenge is something that's very rigid, uh, something I, is I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yes, there's learning objectives that are lined up, but in real time, sometimes I, if it's very, very structured, it can only be done this way. And if it's not, you're like wrong. So that's when it gets to be, because then you become very aware of shortcomings that you're already aware of all the time. Thank you. And 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 that those cases, it feels like it's it's not measuring what you can do. It's measuring who you are. Yeah. Um, now, Claire, to, to move to a slightly more positive light, um, can you name a learning and assessment experience that enabled you to perform your best? Um, yeah, so I really love doing like presentations. Like I, I will rehearse like an actor, like all of my gestures and even my vocal voice and I'll make all these custom slides for it. And I also love that the time frame is quite limited for a presentation. I really have to think about what I'm including. And I think for me, like, because I come from a performance background, it feels more me, like they're assessing me on my own terms um and I've also been looking because I'm thinking of doing honors and postgrad I, I saw at the University of Sydney um one of their courses offered a choice of two assessments so either an essay or a presentation and I was like oh my gosh that's perfect like that's for me <laughs> um well for starters anytime a course coordinator pres then they either start or end with when they introduce an assessment piece and says, I'm really excited to see what everyone comes up with. And you can tell they're genuinely excited. So that just really makes you as a student very excited as well to do it. Um, and I'd say any assessment too, because I look at, um, as a public health student, I look at uh, a lot of numbers, but then a lot of research as well. So numbers are very much not my strength, but Anytime I've had an assessment piece that included kind of a why or a how, where I had an opportunity to explain how I arrived at a conclusion, even if maybe it wasn't the right one, or, um, you know, why did you think that? Um, like, you know, just kind of what was your thought process when I have an opportunity to explain that? So I know even if I didn't get the correct answer, there's still a place for me in the assignment. And then when I take that and apply it in a real world setting, it doesn't mean that I can't step into a type of role that involves numbers, that involves something that I might not be good at. Like I'll always know that there's a place for my train of thought and any type of assessment piece that you can kind of like inject your personality into that you can take on a lot. So um, assessment pieces that are designed where you can incorporate art into it, you can incorporate photography. Um, like I really like talking to people. I'm very curious all the time. So any type of assessment where I get to interact with people that's designed that way, I'm like, yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, yes, assignments like that. So, I mean, that's, that's a really fascinating thing. You know, you talk about um, 
uh, having an opportunity to demonstrate your learning process. And, and I think there's a, um, there's a bit of a synergy going on here because with the, the, the rise of generative AI, you know, we need to think about, um, ways of having a better understanding of, of the thought behind something, not just assess the end product. It's, it's really, you know, we're trying to encourage thought through assessment. So that's fantastic. Um, we've probably got a little bit of time for a question from the room, if anyone would like to ask something. And, and online, if there's any questions, but we'll start with Gwen. Thanks. It's lovely to hear your thoughts. And I, I'm wondering as well, with the inclu assessment also comes feedback. Can you comment on the, the nature of feedback that you felt really supports your learning? Great question. Um, I'd say any type of feedback that feels kind of like a conversation um, and there's room for you to, um, I guess, further expand on what it is. So it's not as if the course coordinator gives you your feedback and then that's it. That's the end of it. Anything that feels as if it's a, something that can continue because I feel that feedback is an ongoing process. It's something that doesn't just stop with one type of piece of assessment and trying to think is there anything you want to add to that? sort of like adding on to that I love the idea of assessment that um is like progressive like it builds on like top of each other like um every few weeks you have a small little writing task and you get feedback and your tutor will tell you oh you need to like work on this and then you can you show like oh I've I've worked on this and I've tried to improve this um I think for me as well, for feedback, I kind of get really annoyed when like tutors say, I don't know what you mean, <laughs> like for um, like a essay I've written and especially for like essay questions where I didn't know what they meant in their question. I'm like, who are you to talk? Like, I don't know what you meant. <laughs> like, yeah. Thank you. John, is, are there any, uh, is there a question online that you'd like the students to respond to? There's just one question from Tim about um, in a group project, um, are there experiences, Elizabeth and Claire, um, with group projects? As if you mean something that, oh, I don't, <laughs> something that uh, works or isn't as effective. Um, I don't, I don't, mind group project because I think as if if everyone's kind of clear um I find those kind of contracts that you sign in the beginning and especially too if the course coordinator follows up with what everyone wrote so then they're kind of clear too um so when you can be really clear with the people you're working with and I think that also mirrors to what you see outside of uni uh, you can say, I'm very good at, you know, uh, talking to people or that's something I prefer, or someone's just happy to do uh, the analysis part of it. And then you can all kind of come together and appreciate that about each other. That's something that in a group assignment, I don't really mind so much because it is you, I don't, they can get a little bit tricky, but it does mirror what you will see outside of here. Um, so just a quick follow-up question, one minute to answer, no pressure. Um, what can, what can course coordinators do to, to assist students, um, with group projects, uh, to make them more, um, accessible and universally designed? Um, I really love the idea of like, from the first tutorial saying, we're having a group project, these are your groups sit up your groups and you sort of can connect with um, your group members and like establish those connections and those contracts and learn each other's personalities. I'd say too, um, when the course coordinator checks in to make sure everyone's, you know, still breathing, they're still, <laughs> they didn't just put you in this group and kind of hope for the best. Uh, so I'd say to them giving feedback or checking in, or I had an assessment where we had to uh, kind of anonymously grade each other. And I knew too that the course coordinator really took it on and the tutorial teacher, they took it seriously. So yes, I think getting feedback within the group project is something that is valuable. 
Well, um, I'd, I'd like to thank, please, please everybody, please thank Claire and Elizabeth. That, that was amazing. I think that, what a lovely scene setting activity. Thank you so much. Um, Amber for a mentee yes, activity. That's yep. correct. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Claire and Elizabeth. That was really insightful. Um, so there's a, I'll take a moment now for some reflection. There are actually two sets of reflection slides. So you can access uh, the link to the mentee to complete your reflection from Padlet. <laughs> um, so there's the bit.ly link to the Padlet. And I think it's the second option. And then you should see a series of questions on a scale for you to reflect on some of the challenges we know um, that course coordinators and teachers face in adjusting assessment. Thank you. So you can find the link to the mentee there as Chris is highlighting on the screen. Might, it's all right, Chris, actually, we're kind of running over time, so we might just, um, we will, collate those responses and share them afterwards, I'll probably post them on the Padlet so that you can see them too, sorry. Um, so we've all got some options and I might hand over now to uh, John to talk uh, in more detail about the Universal Design for Learning Principles. Thanks so much, John. John's presenting from online. Thank you, Amber. And hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to do a little bit more of an explainer of UDL, building on the metaphors that Chris presented earlier. So as the name suggests, UDL is universal design for everyone. And it's not just the students who are the exceptional students at the top of the class or those who are struggling. It, it is everyone. And as what uh, Chris suggested it's uh, earlier, it's it's about reducing barriers and increasing access. And the design of UDL does come from architecture and design of physical environment. So obviously the ramp is reducing barriers for people with mobility issues, but at the same time increasing access, say for parents with prams. Uh, likewise, the automatic doors reducing barriers for people with mobility issues. But then when you're coming out of Woolies on the weekend and you've got your um, hands full with your uh, shopping bags, you know, obviously the automatic doors are increasing access for you. So if we take that idea of uh, reducing barriers and increasing access, and we look at our whole student population, if you look at um, not just people with disabilities, but their life needs and their learning needs, they've all got barriers in some way, and they're looking for ways they can access things very easily. So these are the groups we sometimes don't think about, and we need to consider them. So if we take parents, for example, very time poor, or if you take even the personalities in your classroom, like the extroverts and the introverts. The extroverts really want to collaborate and they really want to network with other people. And the introverts probably more want to look at reflecting on their learning and thinking about uh, how they're processing that learning. So UDL is broken up into three main uh, concepts, if you like. And the first is providing multiple means of engagement. So the different ways you can engage and motivate your students. Why should they be learning this? Secondly, it's the multiple means of representation. And this generally refers to the different ways you can represent the content in your course, giving students different ways to access. And then the multiple ways that students can actually act on what they've learned and express that. So uh, different ways they can present their assessment. And these guidelines come from um, cast.org and they're in the Padlet as a, a link. So you can have a look at that later. But to give some more concrete examples, if we're talking about engagement, 
when introducing a topic, for example, uh, rather than just introducing the topic, well, the real world application, uh, which a lot of us do to try and get students interested. But you could also make it very relevant to their story. So for example, in economics, in a first year course, they introduce the concept of comparative advantage and talk to the students about how it works with their job at McDonald's. How, do they, how does that concept appear in the team that they're working at at McDonald's? Uh, so straight away, it really resonates with the students. You can give them choice about how they want to learn and how they want to participate and whether it's group or individual work. You can differentiate the activities, perhaps give a pretest and work out where the students are in terms of their knowledge of the topic before you dive in. And then, of course, you can ask students to do a self-assessment or reflection. When it comes to representing the, the learning materials and the content in your course, uh, obviously, there's a lot more uh, or different ways you can do that other than text. Um, with multimedia, you actually give students that control, um, even the play bar on the uh, a video helps a lot of students that they can go backwards and forwards, etc. You can chunk the content up rather than this massive long narrative, which a chapter of a book might present, but chunk it in ways that it shows the sequences and how different ideas connect with each other. Let's take rubrics, for example. Um, usually students are given a piece of paper when saying, here's the marking rubric. Um, you can present that in different ways. Um, and I'll give an example of that in a moment. Glossary of terms. We often assume that students know what certain concepts mean because they're meant to be covered in a previous course. It's a good idea sometimes to provide a glossary of terms. Um, concept maps. Um, we can make our courses very visual with Padlets uh, and also with infographics. And then the final part of UDL is how do students express their learning? So you might say, uh, well, it's an essay, but for some students, that doesn't quite work. So there might be another way they can express and still show they demonstrate the learning objective. So it could be a podcast, for example. So just to dive into um, some very basic examples from economics, where I'm a learning designer. One of our postgrad courses um, has a very large uh, international cohort, particularly from China. So we find the students um, really love in our videos that we've produced that they actually have the transcript. And it sounds really, really simple, but I do get comments from the students saying how useful they find that and also that they can actually download the transcripts. So that's a very simple example of representation. Now, I mentioned the rubric before. Another way you can present your rubric is what uh, this course coordinator has done is basically do a recording from their desktop and you can actually create that transcript as well because that video file you create, if you save it in OneDrive, uh, OneDrive uh, enables you when you open the video in the browser to create a transcript for you. So students will find that really, really helpful in terms of trying to understand what's required in the assessment task. At the start of the year, uh, the student um, liaison committee in economics, they said that they wanted a resource about how to write assignments in economics. So I think usually what happens is um, they're told, well, here are the, here are the, here's good practice, for example, how to write the conclusion of a report. And they may be told that, but we created this resource so we thought well what does it actually look like what does a conclusion look like and so we tried to visually represent this 
and then even went and found an example from a previous student of this course and highlighted this way how um, a conclusion can be constructed. So that's another example of how you use UDL and representation of your content. And this is an example of a course, a postgrad course, Economics of Climate Change. Uh, a new course coordinator came in at the start of this year, looked at the ECP and thought two essays in 2022 and thought, we can do this a bit differently and engage the students more. And so the two essays were replaced by um, infographics, as you can see here, and also a policy brief, which obviously would probably be more relevant to an economist. So just to show you the infographic uh, a little bit more. So rather than just writing an essay, is a different way of representing or demonstrating their understanding of the learning objectives. And just one more thing is how do um, how do you actually provide feedback? There was a question before about feedback to Elizabeth and Claire. Now, normally what we do so here's our infographic and we put the text comment in there, but I'd like to highlight here the, the voice comment. We, we do have that functionality to actually record and send an audio to the students. And students may find that more useful. I would even argue that it's probably quicker for the course coordinator or tutor when marking to actually provide feedback in this way. I think an audio feedback too is probably a little bit more relational in a way. And I heard either Claire or Elizabeth talk about it's um, a conversation starter. So I think that's something to think about as well. And so a few other very quick examples of how you can apply UDL. Uh, formative assessment. Obviously, you're giving students um, different representations of how the summative assessment would look like. There's the self-assessment and reflection. And I think reflection is pretty important, particularly now with AI. Um, it's, it seems to be a really good way of getting past AI and if you're worried about academic integrity. But more importantly, it really gets students to think about how it relates to them and to look at their learning. So I mentioned earlier that in economics in the first year, one of the assessment items is that the students actually have to take economic concepts and write about how it applies in their life. So I gave the example before of the student who working at McDonald's was able to uh, articulate how comparative advantage advantage works. Annotated examples. So that um, graphic of the conclusion. So, you know, that's another way of representing what do you mean by a really good conclusion or the body of a report or the introduction. Some coordinators actually give the students previous examples of assessment and actually get them to market against the rubric and then there's a discussion so that's just another way of getting the students to understand what is required in the assessment and then of course if you're talking about bigger sort of capstone type type uh, projects um, UDL works really well there as well so very quickly just finally when you're thinking about your assessment if we're looking at reducing barriers and increasing access I encourage you to really think about what are you really assessing? Now, assessment has a construct. So the constructs are usually the, the knowledge, skills, or abilities that you're trying to measure, uh, particularly in relation to your learning objectives. But sometimes we are 
bringing in unintended barriers. So think about what you're not assessing. So if you think about an exam, while you're um, developing an exam, which is to get the students to demonstrate learning objectives, same time, you're also asking them or assessing them unintentionally on things like motor coordination and short-term memory. And they're really irrelevant in terms of what you're trying to assess. So that's just a thought to um, hold. Um, I've been given the wind up. Uh, so I'll move on now to Linda. And, and yes, now for the amazing Linda Chavella. Thank you. Not about amazing, but thank you. Um, so here's one we prepared earlier. A couple of years ago, I took over a course, Soki 1070, Inequality, Society and the Self. It was the result of PA2. A whole bunch of courses all got shoved together and had to be rethought very quickly. And um, it was an absolutely glorious failure. So, and I really reveled in that failure. The thinking behind it was sound. We thought we'd do a whole heap of group work. It's a first year course. We'd create all these wonderful experiences for students to come together as a cohort, have all these interactive experiences. Students voted with their feet very fast. No way did they want to do group work. No way did they want to talk to other students. And so this actually created the perfect opportunity to completely rethink what I was doing. And I really need to give a shout out to the learning design team, and especially Amber, who's been so helpful with this. Um, thanks, John. If you don't mind, just next slide. So this is a screenshot of just some of the student assessment um, access plans that I've received. Yours would all look very, very similar, uh, completely contradictory. So over here, we've got, I want more structure. Here is less structure. Here is, I need deadlines. Here is, please don't give me deadlines. This one says, can you please give me cue cards? Uh, this one says, I have time blindness. This one says, I have difficulty sharing in front of large groups. This one says, I've experienced light sensitivity. This one is, I have difficulty staying on task. So I teach 200 students. Now, I know compared to your course, Quinn, with 800 students, it's tiny. But to put it in the words of a previous head of school, prior to this, I was teaching what he called luxury boutique courses, which only had 30 to 50 students. And that gave me a perfect opportunity to learn who the students were and I could make all sorts of individual con um, adjustments. But I found when I got to 200, that was no longer flying. It's too many students to try and make adjustments for. It created administrative nightmares. And it was also reliant on students to have a plan because, of course, we know these are only the students that step forward and tell us they need assistance. There's a bunch of others who are just really struggling and don't tell us. So this is what I was thinking about is how do I make this course work for all of these students or as many students as possible? And I had the fortunate experience of going along and hearing John's presentation and I immediately went, oh, my goodness, this is a wonderful framework I can try. So I want to say up front, I don't have the solution. What I'm sharing is some of my experiments over the last two years, and it's very much a work in progress, as I will show you. Okay, thanks, John. So you'll notice John's slides here because this is exactly what I did. I sat down and I thought, how can I rethink engagement? Um and so I, instead of having compulsory participation and all these participatory activities, I immediately said, okay, you don't have to come to class. That's the first thing. So there is no reason for you to be in class. If you don't want to be with other people, you don't have to be. So we turned it into a flipped classroom mode. Um, we have online learning and weekling face-to-face -face workshops that students are welcome to come to if they'd like. There's group and individual work. Uh, no pressure for students to actually be in a group if they don't want to. Asynchronous and synchronous content. So face-to-face, -face, you know, everyone turns up at the same time, uh, but the online materials can be um, accessed at any time. Um, scaffolding participation experiences. So the old think, pair, share, do a lot of that. So have time to think, share with one other person, share with two other people, Okay, what's an idea from your table? So really trying to create safe spaces for students to practice using their voices and also practice using the language of the course because terms that are very comfortable for me, I can talk about intersectionality, no problem. 
But for some students, that's not a word that they're familiar with. So getting them to just practice at their tables means they're not risking humiliating themselves in front of students. And one of the things I'm really conscious of, and I guess I'm thinking particularly about my first year students who've come out of high school, is their social media experience is one of deep humiliation and bullying for many of them, that they post something online on Facebook or chat or whatever that will, you can tell how old I am, whatever the social media platform is, and the response is to immediately be pulled apart, to be pulled down. And so if students have come from that background where anything that involves public um discourse is likely to be too high a risk, they're not going to engage in a classroom. So this is about reframing trust. So it also thinks about um, module worksheets to prepare for in-class discussions. So for students who don't do well with on-the-spot questions, whether it be because of language or neurodiversity, I let them know, here are the questions we're going to be doing in class this week. Here's what you need to have done to prepare for that conversation. Um, and then assessment one, picking up on one of John's points before, it requires application of concepts to their own story. So instead of me standing there and saying, oh, well, when I was 24, I did this and I did that and I had this wonderful experience, I'm asking them, what does intersectionality look in your life, look like in your life? What does prejudice mean in the context of your life? So the assessment comes back to their story rather than my story. Thanks, John. How am I going for time? Speed up, slow down. Okay, uh, multiple means of representation. And I really want to say here, this isn't new. Most of you would be doing some of this. And I guess part of my role here is to affirm that for you and to say, yes, we're already doing a lot of it. So things like using text, visual and oral methods to communicate across a course, uh, learner controlled medium, chunking content, all these things on the side. We did things like, as I said, we flipped the classroom using H5P. Um, we had uh, Blackboard prior to class. Students could undertake the activities prior to coming to class and then in class would engage in conversation. The kind of activities we had via H5P are things like mini lectures, links to internet sites, readings, pre-recorded guest lectures, video clips, TikToks, cartoons, songs, quizzes, learning checks, reflections. So we tried to give as much different kind of engagement as we could. Um, and in terms of what then happened on campus, they had a two-hour in-class workshop each week. The first hour was an opportunity to process the content through group discussions and activities. And the second hour was directly addressing the assessment tasks. So, for example, they had an infographic. The second hour might be, let's talk about design principles in an infographic. So it's that kind of thing. Thanks, John. Oh, and one thing I should have said about the previous one is what was really important was when we put the modules together, we gave a time guide for every single activity. So it's if you're going to read this article and you have standard reading time, it will take you half an hour. And so students very early on were encouraged to time themselves and that way they knew, okay, if Linda says half an hour, it's actually going to take me 45 minutes. Uh, if they had a quiz, I'd tell them it's going to be a five-minute quiz. If it's go and watch a video, it's going to be a one-hour video. So students could actually chunk down their time and take it off in little manageable pieces. Um, we rethought action and expression. Some of the non-assessed stuff that we did in class were things like group discussions, mind maps, padlets, physical activities like transect walks across the, the courtyards, butcher's paper, whiteboard drawings, games, exhibitions, and gallery walks. The assessment was some journal entries, so that was written. They then had an infographic, and that was a visual assignment, and the last assignment was oral, where they had a video reflection on their infographic. And so what I've got there is um, essentially writing, um, seeing, and then speaking. Now, the reason that's not brilliant, and the students have brought this to my attention, is because there's no choice. At some point, they have to do all of that. But my hope is that there's at least some softer landing places across the course for them to say, yeah, this is a this is a piece I'm comfortable with. This one's going to stretch me, but this is my home zone. Thanks, John. So some of the challenges in putting this together, um, workload, and I've said there the illusion of workload. So it takes so much work. It's easy to tweak, but when you're completely pulling a course apart and putting it back together again, it's massive, especially if you've now done it three times and in three years. But the other problem is we don't, I think, in academia understand the workload of teaching very well. Um, we have a very outdated model. So my head of school, whom I love, still thinks, oh, your course is online, so therefore you don't have to do as much. 
Um, so we, what she doesn't understand is every time I make a change somewhere in the course, I have to go and change it in about five places, change the timing, give new instructions, rewrite the slide, go back into the H5P module and redo it. The workload is massive. Um, but because we still have this idea that teaching is this, rather than what happens behind the scenes, then the workload tools don't work very well for us. Um, choice is limited. There's the provision of range across the semester, but I can't give all students all the time the choice. Sorry, can't give students choice all the time. It's not total free choice. And the other part of this is students, people don't choose well. None of us do. Um, Blake McKinney talks about a lot about this, which I really appreciate. So I can say to students, you're free to choose, but you're not free from the consequences of those choices. So you can choose not to come to class, but you're not free from the fact that you're going to end up socially isolated as a result. Or you can choose not to watch the videos, but you're not free from the consequence of not learning that content. So it's, kind of, it's one thing to give choice, but it's also as a teacher, what's then our responsibility to try and help students and particularly students who are struggling to understand the consequence. And I've got generative AI in highlights because I've just realised it's completely stuffed up all my assessment. I'm going to have to start again this Christmas. So there goes those holidays again. Um, last slide. Thanks very much, John. I just wanted to share this. This was some feedback I got from a student this semester. And the student says, I'll read it because it's a bit tricky. She says, or he says, I would really appreciate some proper teaching. You must explain theory and concepts to us before class discussion and do it yourself. Do not just give us the YouTube videos and journal articles. This is an expensive course and I'd expect so much more. Do the work yourself and teach us. So my point, and I actually carry this around with me all the time because it's a great example of I can do everything in my universe to try and create an interesting and inviting and inclusive learning experience. But if that student has a preferred way of learning, it's not going to meet it. And it may be that for this student, learning means a lecture. And if I'm not doing that, I'm giving videos and YouTube clips. And for them, that's not learning. That's what not what they're paying for. So it's also recognising that in this incredibly experimental space, we're not going to make people happy. Um, all we can do is try and include more students more of the time. Thank you. Oh, and any more suggestions for assessment are really welcome. Thank you, Linda. I promised she was amazing, so she delivered. Um, so now it's your turn. Um, so in the, the Padlet, uh, there's a link to a Google Doc. Um, and in that Google Doc, we have a dummy ECP. Uh, and there are, and for the, by the, those of you in the room, there's a, there are copies, physical copies in front of you wish to have those. Um, so um, one, one way we're modeling a little bit of UDL here is it's, it's your choice of which assessment item you want to look at. Um, so what, what we're trying to do here is if you can have a look at these assessment items and um, think about which one of them you'd like to um, revisit or, or tweak with a UDL lens. Is there something that we can you could do to improve it? Um, in the Google Doc, um, you can add a comment to each assessment item. Um, and it's up to you whether you work in um, work at your table in groups or individually. And um, I think online, what, what how do you want to do this, John? You want to do breakouts? Uh, I or? have a breakout room for each of those three assessment items, and participants online can choose. When I open the breakout rooms, they can choose which one they want to go to. Got, we've got about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, are there any questions before we get started? Yes. The class size. That's an excellent question. Let's say 300. And you can tell I thought that through very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any questions online? Any questions there, John? No. 15 minutes. Is... Right. Uh, I will pause. I'll, I'll pause the recording now and turn off the in-room audio. Yep. And we'll go to the breakout rooms. Jim, limited marking support. Yes. 
sort of hover around. Yes, yes. So select some text and then a plus button will appear on the right. And you click that plus button to make a comment. And um, there was a question about limited marking support. Well, so we'll assume that. Okay, so thank you very much. And we'll regroup in 15 or 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay, the breakout rooms are open. So... Hopefully you should see the three choices. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, We're back. So. Right? So we just to uh, have a quick rip around, whip around of um, some of that feedback. Um, so I heard some great things at the table about um, uh, maybe limiting the the number of um, weekly re of reflections, perhaps, and maybe giving some option in there and thinking about different topics. It could be there, bit, be a bit more explicit. Um, and for the in class presentation, I see that Shari's got. Um, an, a great Very idea to break space. it down into authentic tasks. And for the essay on social media, I see that we've got, sorry, just, I see that we've got, um, yeah. yeah, so it, it, it needs to be a bit more, a bit more well described. And uh, yeah, we need a bit more information about how to do this. And yeah, um, and Dom's got an idea about shifting from essay to sharing ideas across the selection of three different media. Nice. All right, I'll hand back to Amber. Thank you. Now we've just got our online folks back, Chris. everybody for participating in that exercise i'll have to take my time to read through all the um comments later and, and um, pass them on as we as we work through assessment redesign john are you able to share the slides again when you're ready <laughs> thanks for your patience everybody Yeah, maybe one more. We've got about 50 laptops on the go at the same time, I think. Went a bit too fancy. Thanks, John. I really appreciate your management of this. And then, yeah, yes, resources and next steps. So we're wrapping up um, and we'd like to provide you with a few options for what you might do next in terms of digging in a bit deeper. So you'll see on the um, Padlet, we've got a few links to some further resources outside of UQ, including a direct link to the um, assessment design tips using UDL that's been handed out in, in, the, in the classroom here as well. We'd also encourage you to sign up to the Australian Disability Clearinghouse for Education and Training newsletter it's a mouthful that's a I think it's federally funded and it's specific to Australian higher education um, uh, it's probably been my best source of professional development over time they run lots of seminars lots of um, higher education staff sharing their practice across multiple universities it's usually free in fact it's always free as far as I'm aware for for that reason and um We've also got some exciting um, options coming up. Thank you, Gwen. I know you're in the room today. So work from Gwen Laurie as well as Jack Wang and Deanne Ganaway. I think it's a 2022-2023 Teaching Innovation Grant. Yeah, so we let's go to that slide. Um, they've been working on some, I believe, some gorilla surveys <laughs> to collect some. And then, oh, next slide when you're ready, if you could, please, John. So 
Gwen, feel free to jump up and, and jump in. My understanding is that from next year, there'll be a range of ways that you can uh, engage further with inclusive teaching practices, including some online self-placed modules, as well as uh, some in-person workshops and a diagnostic tool or evaluation tool to help you really assess your strengths and areas you want to focus on in, in terms of inclusive teaching practice, very evidence informed from literature reviews, as well as a range of, of staff and student surveys or just student. Great, thank you, a student, student partnership project and staff. Oh, great, it'll come up in Workday so you can um, let all your bosses know that you've done it if they can if they can navigate Workday successfully. Um, I'm super looking forward to getting stuck into those, so thank you. And I think that's, that's the end of our session today. So we've finished bang on time, look at us. Thank you so much for your engagement online and in person. Um, oh, there's one more thing. On the Padlet, the last activity is a chance for you to tell us what else you'd like to know or learn or try. And that will help us um, think about what our next workshop is or our next resource. So feel free to add any of your thoughts there or you can sneak off and have some lunch. And we've got a question. Really quick question. Will you be sharing the slides from today? Yeah. Yeah. We'll share everything. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, which is our one. Yeah, thanks for asking. And I believe there'll also be a recording that we can talk to yourself to rewatch if you really wanted to. Thanks. Thank you, everyone online. And thank you, John, for navigating that and Chris for navigating all those laptops. And, and thanks again to our presenters um, and to our student panel. We really appreciate your efforts.